Mr. McCoy here again with part 20 of A Family Apart. Although the white frosted hills were serene under a clear sky, the wind prickled Frances's face with sharp shivers of cold, so she kept urging Sal and Daisy to keep up their pace. She, as she looked west, she thought long about Megan. The couple who took her had a home out on the prairie. It was so far away, and Frances missed her sister so much she hoped the isolated prairie life would not be hard on the gentle, sensitive Megan. Frances missed Ma, too. She could hardly wait to get to the Cummings's farm so she could write to her mother. When she wrote to Ma of her adventure, Frances would also tell her that she'd been wrong, that now she really did understand Ma's sacrifice. Frances was almost home when the marshal and the two bounty hunters suddenly appeared on the road. They'd never know how close they'd come to the slaves they'd been tracking. They'd ride on, retracing their steps toward the north, searching for Odette and Janice in vain. Francis raised a hand to wave at the marshal and was surprised when he turned to the bounty hunters and rode beside her for a few moments. Why do you suppose this is happening? Share what you think with your fellow listeners. Glad the weather didn't close in on you, he said. It was an easy trip, Francis answered. She was aware that one of the men was poking the barrel of his rifle in the back of the wagon. She supposed she suppressed a smile. He wasn't going to find any hidden slaves behind the cake and the cheese. The cheese. Suddenly Francis realized that she foolishly had used Odette's shawl to wrap the pot of cheese. How could she have been so stupid? She froze, clinging to the rein so tightly, her fingers became numb. Give my, re give my regards to your folks, Marshal Dawson said, and he urged his horse off. But one of the bounty hunters suddenly yelled, Wait a minute, Marshal. Pull up, boy. He pointed his rifle at her head to make sure that she obeyed. The man grabbed the wrapped pot of cheese and shook the shawl until its contents tumbled into the wagon. He waved the shawl over his head. Ain't this what that slave woman was wearing? The other bounty hunter examined it closely. Looks like. Where did you get this shawl? The marshal asked. Francis. This time, and this time his voice was stern. I found it on the ground, Francis said truthfully. I used it to wrap the cheese so it wouldn't freeze. On the ground where? Marshal Dawson asked. Francis lifted her chin, staring back. No matter how frightened she was, she wasn't about to give him an answer. We can figure it out, one bounty hunter said to his partner. Come on, let's head north. You take care of this law-breaking boy, Marshal tossed the shawl into the wagon and the two of them set off at a gallop. Janice and Odette had been given a long head start. Mrs. Mueller had promised that they be in no more danger and the Muellers could handle these two ruffians. So Frances didn't worry about them. She only wanted to get home to Jake and Margaret. Could they help her? What would become of her? I'll ride back with you to Jake's place. The marshal's words broke into her thoughts. You know, son, that as of now, you're under arrest. Francis jumped as though he'd struck her. Under arrest? Did that mean she'd go to prison? She shuddered. Would Jake and Margaret be arrested too? What would happen to Petey? Her new parents had made a home for her, and now everything was about to be lost. Tears spilled from her eyes, stinging her cheeks. She'd lose her new family and her old family. Do you think this is going to happen? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. As they reached the house, Marshal Dawson, Dawson was firm with Jake, who had come out on the porch. The Marshal explained what had been found in the wagon and what it obviously meant. Frankie is innocent of breaking any law. Jake said. He's a child, 
any fault that may be found is mine. Frankly, the marshal said, my sympathies lie with the abolitionists, but I'm sworn to uphold the law. I've got no proof that you had anything to do with this, Jake, so I'm not putting you under arrest, but whether you had to or not, I've still got to arrest this boy and take him to town to be charged. That shawl is your only proof, Margaret objected. Frankie found, said he found it. Anyone could have dropped it. Petey ran out on the porch calling, They're coming! They're coming! I saw them from the window upstairs! Everyone turned to look in the direction Petey was pointing. See? Petey yelled. Mr. McNair and Mrs. Banks, they said they'd come and see us, and there they are. Oh no, Francis whispered in agony that they should see her being arrested. Not now. The marshal put a firm hand on Francis's shoulder. I have to take this boy with me. I have to, he said. Margaret pushed his hand away. No, she cried. Frankie is my son, and I won't let you have him. Jake, even more pale than before, stepped between Francis and the marshal. We need to talk, Marshal Dawson, but let's wait until Andrew McNair gets here. Frankie is still under Andrew's supervision. Andrew tied their horses to the rail as Catherine ran up onto the porch. She put her arms on Margaret's shoulders and studied her face. What's wrong? she asked. What happened? I'll tell you, the marshal said, and proceeded to list the facts. Catherine shook her head and laughed, while Margaret gasped and said, Catherine, this situation is not humorous. Of course it is, Catherine said. It's nonsense. She smiled at the marshal. Do you actually believe that a little 13-year-old girl could do all that you say? Girl? Everyone stared and turned at Francis, and stared at Francis, who began to blush furiously. I, I, I'm sorry, she stammered. It's true. I really am a girl. I didn't know what to do except pose as a boy. I overheard Mr. McNair saying the boys were easier to place together, and I'd promised our ma that I'd take care of Petey. I borrowed Mike's knife to cut my hair and put on some boys' clothes. She looked around the group from face to face. Jake's mouth fell open. Margaret's eyebrows shot up, and Andrew looked completely bewildered. It did work out, Francis added, because Petey and I were able to stay together. The marshal cleared his throat <clears throat> a couple of times before he said, I can't just take your word for it, young man. Uh, well, whoever you are, I suppose I'll need proof. Francis shrank back against Margaret, who shouted at the marshal, Oh, no, you won't. For a moment, he looked bewildered, then his face turned a dark red. Well, I... I didn't mean, he stuttered. Catherine smiled at the marshal. As I see it, we have only one problem to settle. The ownership of that shawl. You said it was a black shawl with blue embroidered flowers in the corner. He nodded. Why, Marshal, she said, I do believe that could be mine. If you're ever in St. Joe, I'll see if I can find a bill of sale for it. Marshal Dawson pursed his lips together and rubbed hard at his chin. Francis wondered if he were trying to keep from laughing. It appears there's been a big mistake, he said, and a broad smile succeeded in escaping. We now have no evidence that a crime has been committed. In any case, there's no way I'm going to arrest a little girl. Touching the brim of his hat and nodding to the women, this time including Francis, he got back on his horse and rode away. For a moment, no one spoke. It was more than Francis could take. It's so very tired I am of pretending to be a boy, she cried. Even if you send me away, I need to be myself. I need to be a girl again. I didn't want to lie to you, and I can't do it anymore. Her tears burst out in a torrent. Margaret's arms were around her, hugging her, holding her, stroking back her cropped hair. And it was Margaret's voice she heard, soothing her, saying, Oh, Frankie, I love having a daughter. 
Francis held Margaret tightly, the love she felt melting away all the mixed up feelings that had been tormenting her. She would always love Ma, whether she could be with her or not, but she had a new home with people who loved her too, who generously shared her life with Petey and her. What an enormous relief it was not to have to pretend any longer to be someone she wasn't. It occurred to her with a jolt that there was something she'd forgotten and maybe Margaret and Jake had too. She pulled away from Margaret, Margaret turning earnestly to Jake. Because I'm a girl, it doesn't mean I can't still help you with farm work. I'm strong and I work hard. You saw how quickly I learned to milk the cows and handle the horses. I... Jake lifted a hand to quiet Francis. For a moment, he seemed to think about it. Then he grinned and Francis knew he'd been pretending. I'd just as soon work with a daughter as a son, he said. His eyes became serious. No son could make me any more proud than I am right now of you, Frankie. Rush. Not Frankie. Her name is really Francis Mary, Petey shouted in a rush. It's not a secret anymore, so I can tell her real name. He broke off, clapping a hand over his mouth and whispered cautiously, Can't I? Laughing, the men led the horses off to the barn to care for them, Petey on their heels. Francis took the handkerchief Margaret handed her and wiped her eyes, staring with wonder at Catherine. How did you know I was a girl? Two reasons. Catherine reached into the cloth purse that hung at her waist and pulled out a letter. Your mother wrote to you about asked to ask about the welfare of her children, telling something about each of you and giving your full names. She handed the envelope to Francis. I know you'd like to read her letter. Oh, yes, Francis said, clutching it eagerly. Catherine continued. Finding you were a Francis Mary instead of a Francis didn't come as that much of a surprise to me. She lowered her voice and grinned at Francis. I began to suspect that you were a girl by the way you looked at Andrew McNair. Francis felt her cheeks grow warm and she ducked her head. He's too old for you, Catherine teased. But not for you, Margaret added with a chuckle. However, that's just between us women. Francis hugged, laughed, hugging Margaret again. Wait until my brothers and sisters find out what has happened, she exclaimed. Mike will think it's more exciting than a dime novel, Catherine said. As far as I'm concerned, Francis said, the best thing is that now I'm back to being a girl. Grandma Briley gently closed the cover of the journal and lightly pat patted the soft blue binding. Jennifer leaned forward eagerly. Don't stop. Yeah, Jess said. Tell us more. Grandma got out of her chair and pinched two shriveled leaves from a hanging basket of pothos ivy. Not now, she said. I'm going to make dinner early because the city council meeting is tonight. But if you'd like me to, I'll tell you Mike's story tomorrow. What about those people who adopted Mike? Jeff asked. I didn't like them, Jennifer said. Neither did Mike, Grandma told her. I suspected them right away, Jeff said. Grandma looked mysterious. Then you won't be surprised to find out that Mike was suspicious of them too. Why, Mike even began to wonder if Mr. Friedrich had committed a murder. Murder, Jeff said. Tell us, did he? For now, you can help me set the table, Grandma teased. Mike's story will just have to wait until tomorrow. So what do you suppose this is all about with Mr. Friedrich possibly committing a murder and other adventures with Mike? Share your predictions with your fellow listener. Mike's story continues in Caught in the Act. You'll find his adventures to be truly amazing.